everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Fish Health on the Farm. What can I do and resources when it's beyond me? Today, we have an expert panel with Bob Rohde, Dr. Myron Kibis, and Bill Kelleher. My name is Nicole Wright, and I am an extension educator with Ohio Sea Grant, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we start today, we want to acknowledge that the Great Lakes watershed encompasses the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands and waters of indigenous nations. As original caretakers of our region's lands, waters, and life beings, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and the complex history and experiences in this region. I'd also like to briefly tell you about the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative and what we do. The Collaborative, or GLAC, as it is called, is a partnership among the eight Great Lakes Sea Grant programs in the states you see here highlighted in light blue. For those of you not familiar with Sea Grant, we're a federal university partnership between NOAA and a university in each coastal state. Our mission is to bring oh. science to our communities and solve problems. I don't think you're sharing your screen. Oh, I apologize. One moment. Can you see it now? Yes, that looks yes, good. That looks good. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Here are the highlighted states that are part of the Black Collaborative. Our goal is to provide science-based information and activities that support an environmentally responsible, competitive, and sustainable aquaculture industry in the Great Lakes region. We use a variety of methods to reach our goal, including convening state and regional advisory groups, conducting webinars such as this, hosting events like our recent Great Lakes Aquaculture Days, which featured six regional farm tours, and also conducting research, answering questions relevant to Great Lakes aquaculture. Finally, we also have a website where all of our recordings of virtual programs are stored, as well as additional information about aquaculture in the Great Lakes region. Additionally, we recently launched a new website called the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder. This is a website for consumers to connect with businesses for wild caught and aquaculture raised fish and seafood products. I'd like to also thank the rest of the webinar committee that helped put this webinar together behind the scenes and also planned the rest of the webinars that we have had previously um, here in 2021 with GLAC. Finally, just a few tips. We are all here to learn, so there are no dumb questions. You can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for questions for our speakers or technology issues. You can also contact Christina Dierkes in the chat if you have technology issues and she may be able to help you as well. Also in the chat, feel free to use that for networking and sharing resources, but please no advertising or soliciting. Um, I will also let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and we will share this online in the next week or two. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Bob Rohde. Christina, can you stop my screen share? I'm also having an issue where I can't. Thank you. I'm gonna hand it over to Bob Rohde, who is going to talk to us about identifying fish health problems. Hi, so I'm Bob Rohde. I'm the uh manager of the Aquaculture Research Lab here at Purdue University. Um, my background, I've been here for about 15 years and um, I've worked with, in my past, I've worked with quite a number of different species. Um, 
I've worked with catfish in ponds, marine fish and in indoor systems, and most of the common species here in the Midwest, uh, largemouth bass, yellow perch and walleye, tilapia, and rainbow trout. And with that, I'll kind of get started into my, my talk. Can everybody see that? Okay. You'll um, want to switch. Um, if you go to switch. display settings at the top and switch the, the way that your uh, screen is shared, you're currently sharing your notes page. There you go. Okay. Thank you. That's why I asked. <laughs> um, I think the first thing about identifying signs and symptoms of of sick fish is you need to know what a normal fish behavior is or what your fish normally act like. And this can uh, vary greatly depending on your culture system. If you're using tanks and have relatively clean water, clear water, you can pretty much tell what your fish are doing on a minute to minute basis. If you're in a pond or even cage culture in a pond, it might be more difficult depending on the turbidity of water. So that's the first thing to overcome is trying to figure out what your fish are doing visually. Uh, the second thing is how are your fish acting uh, at different times of the day under different conditions? Um, obviously a tank is very limited in the, the amount of space that the fish has as opposed to a pond. So their behavior might be different there. Um, temperature can also have a big effect. If you're using indoor systems with a relatively constant temperature, your behavior should be, should not be affected by temperature. But if you're outside, a cold front can drastically change the behavior of your fish from day to day. Also water quality parameters, whether there's low oxygen, high ammonia, those sort of things can affect behavior. And also the densities, how the fish act when they're relatively close to each other. So these can all have an effect on normal fish behavior. And you need to know that first before trying to figure out if you're, well, the absence of normal behavior makes you uh, suspect you might have some sort of disease issue or unhealthy fish. So you need to know what's normal first. So, it can also vary with species. I've worked with a lot of species of fish in different conditions and they all do act differently. In particular, the last several years I've worked with largemouth bass and walleye and a lot of my comments are gonna be based on them because they act very different. Um, all species have a normal pattern of swimming and behavior. I mean, obviously most of them are straight ahead. They're not gonna back up and they're usually vertically, well, vertically or horizontally oriented in the, in the water column, depending on how you're looking at it. But basically they're swimming straight ahead using a level conditions. If they're swimming different than that, obviously there could be something you should, that, that's a suspect that there might be something wrong. Also, they have a tendency to, especially in ponds, uh, relegate themselves in the water column, depending on the species. Some fish like it, down deep, uh, like walleye would like a, a prefer a deeper water column where it's cooler. Uh, some of the, like a tilapia will be at the surface. Catfish definitely will come up to feed, but generally hang out at the bottom. Even largemouth bass have uh, pretty much dug out wallows where they all congregate on the bottom. So you need to know where they're normally at and how they're swimming in a current, if you have a current, like in a tank. Um, there's some recent literature on walleye that if the swimming, if the current is too fast, they can wear themselves out and get fin rot and that leads to disease issues. So you need to know what, what your fish can handle on, on a normal day-to-day -day rearing conditions. Um, I put in here in my outline spook factor. Most fish, if you walk up to the tank or are on the pond bank, are going to run away from you, are going to move away from a shadow or something uh, that's near to their habitat. Um, if they don't do that, that's also a warning sign. Most fish, I mean, is their first thing is a flight response. 
So if they are not going away from you, um, they could be hungry, but also, I mean, you can even try to spook them, which is not necessarily a good thing. But if, if you stand there for a long time, make a lot of activity and they're not moving away from you, you should su suspect that something else is wrong too. And then some fish are very good at schooling, others are more individual. Um, I know my largemouth bass are generally spread throughout the pond in little pockets. They are have like uh, subgroups, potentially you could call it. Um, other species like catfish are one on top of the other in big groups. Um, but you didn't need to know what the, the normal is before you um, delve into what could be going wrong. And then feeding behavior is also important. That's probably the key um, factor we use to tell how our fish are in terms of are they healthy or, or sick or getting sick. Um, the aggressiveness of feeding is usually the first thing we look at, the response to feeding. Although not all fish are aggressive feeders. I know my walleye are very much what we call ambush feeders. They just kind of hang there, wait for the feed and then bang. Whereas uh, catfish, largemouth bass, those sorts of fish are very aggressive feeders coming up to hit floating feed. Some fish need a uh, more sinking diet because they are not attracted to the surface or do not like to be at the surface like walleye and yellow perch. So it's a little bit of a uh, trying to figure out what's going on with a sinking feed. There are ways to do it. You can feed in shallow areas and see if they come into that. Um, and every once in a while, you might have to get in the pond if you can't see what's going on and see if the feed's being eaten after X amount of time. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So that the main thing I want to get out of this is that you have to know what your normal fish behavior is for whatever species you're raising before you can even delve into, are my fish, are my fish sick? So when should you worry your fish are sick? So like I said, in, in less turbid waters, it's pretty easy or easier where you can see how they're acting. Are they swimming erratically or regularly? Do they tilt? Do they try to flash up against the side or bottom of the tank? Mostly what's out of normal or what's abnormal behavior. And like I said, if they won't spook very easily, that's a telling sign that there might be something wrong. They're lethargic, they don't wanna feed or they feed very poorly. Those are early warning signs that you might have an issue. Something that can be confusing is if you have drastic changes in temperature that might put uh, fish off feed and not, might not be related to some disease issue. It might just be a biological factor that their metabolism has slowed down. Or your water quality might be poor. Maybe you have high ammonia, high nitrite, and that will put them off feed as well. So you need to really um, investigate more than just is the fish sick. Because in most cases, you're not going to want to try to sample those fish, number one, because it puts a stress on all the fish when you start dipping a net into a tank or pulling a seine through a pond. Um, and so you don't want to increase our stress level any more than normal anyways. And um, uh, I forget the other thing, but mostly you don't want to, you want to try to not stress them out by sampling if you can get away with it. If you really feel like, okay, um, I'm pretty sure they're sick, that's when you can try to uh, get in and sample a few fish that are lethargic, not moving very well, and try to investigate what's wrong. And mortalities, probably with the pond situation, that's the the first way, if you have really turbid water, that's the first way you're gonna see any signs or symptoms that your fish are sick other than not feeding. Um, and not all mortalities necessarily mean that you have some kind of disease issue. Each mortality or mortalities need to be investigated on an individual basis. Uh, I know on our pond system here at the university, we do have 
some blue herons. We do have some bald eagles. Um, those mortalities, I know they're going to happen. And I'll make sure that that's actually what did happen before I jump to the conclusion that my fish are sick because I have a mortality on the pond. Especially with big fish, if a heron gets them, uh, more than likely they've been speared and not eaten because the fish can't, the bird can't ingest that big a fish. And so I know it was from the bird as opposed to some disease issue in the pond. Um, and so anytime you have, where you have, you think your fish are sick, what are you gonna do? Well, it's not just looking at the fish. You need to look at any uh, records you have for water quality and environmental factors that might have affected that. Also feeding behavior, has your feeding quantities gone down over time for a fish that should be growing? Um, like I said, if for water quality, has your oxygen been slowly decreasing or, or uh, basically you're looking at trends. Could it be a, a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Instead of a sudden event, a more chronic issue where uh, your water has deteriorated over time slowly, but has now reached a point where you might be getting some disease issues coming in, or could it be a one-time event where you had very low oxygen levels, the fish survived, but were stressed, and then potentially got sick after that event. So those are things to look at. Uh, also, you should use all your senses. I mean, it's not just um, a sense of sight. A lot of times, if you've been around fish farms for quite a while, you can tell things just by sense of smell, or perhaps you have a pump that's cavitating and creating uh, some gas issues in your, in your uh, tank. So these are things you can use all your senses to try to look at and see if these have been factors that could cause your fish to become sick. And then we get to actual examination of sick or, or sick fish or mortalities. So there's basically on farm you can do, and we'll, I'm sure the other guys will talk about this. You can do a real quick external exam. Yes, the fish got poked by a, a bird or Ooh, it's got an open wound. That's probably pretty easy to determine. Um, and then you get into internal where you get, you really need a microscope to look at the gill filaments and stuff like that. I really didn't want to get into any of that with my talk because that's really a, a fish health talk all in itself is what to look at and that sort of thing. Ultimately though, if you really think you have sick fish, you want to at least contact a vet or a diagnostic service to confirm the diagnosis before you do any treatments. Um, here, I'll just talk for the state of Indiana. We now have a few vets that on the private sector that can uh, assist with diagnosis. And we do have the state lab where you can take your fish to confirm the diagnosis. Um, and that's always good before you jump to a prescription. Unless it's something you've seen time after time after, I know I'm going to get columnaris disease when I do this kind of activity with my fish and this is the treatment I've always used. If that's the case, that's you can pretty much do that on your own, but if it's anything new and you're gonna need a treatment, you need to get it confirmed, number one, to make sure it's pregnant, but number two, in almost any disease issue nowadays, you're gonna to have to have a prescription from a vet to get any kind of drugs to treat the disease. So that's kind of where I'll leave it. Um, and I guess we should have plenty of time for questions. And that's my contact information if anybody needs it. Thanks, Bob. We, had, we did have one clarification. Um, someone asking if you can go over what you mentioned about current and fin rot. Can you go over that comment again? Sure, I don't remember the number per se, uh, I can look it up if somebody's really curious, but um, for walleye in particular, the amount of current can force them to swim so much that they basically wear their tails out or they get, I don't know, if it's from hitting the tank sides and bottom or if it's just the muscle deteriorating, but their tails will, will get what 
appears to be like a fungus and eventually will rot off if it gets too far. And then those fish are obviously, they can't swim very well. And, um, but it has to do with the, the determination is by body length. So the current can't be more than so many body lengths per second. And I'd have to look at my notes to see what that is. I can do that. I could probably do that while the other speakers are doing and giving their talks. Okay, sounds good. And also we will be putting together a resource information sheet that we can add information to as well. Um, Bob, are you able to um, join us for the, the Q&A at the end of this? Yes, today? because of this terrible weather, rain here, my, I also coach lacrosse and our practice got canceled. So I'm hanging around for a while. <laughs> okay, great. We'll see you soon again. All right, next up, we are going to have Dr. Myron Hebbis. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. Well, I want to thank the um, organizers um, of, of from uh, GLAC and from Sea Grant um, from for inviting me, and um, I was invited to speak to talk about a decision tree um, on how to make a decision and really orient it toward the farmers, and so that's what I did. And um, I'm going to present some slides to uh, kind of illustrate that. You saw a little bit of the biography, but just a little bit more, just to give you a little sense. Before my veterinary training, I worked in aquaculture. So I worked with fish farms and I worked uh, um, with um, aquaculture research and and I've been working for a number of years and had an opportunity to work with a number of different species of, of fish. Um, I listed some of them and also um, worked quite a bit with uh, poultry dairy and some other sectors. So just to give you a little perspective. So today we're gonna to talk about more the diagnostics and diagnosis. And um, for future talks, um, it'd be great to talk about and get into more detail. Perhaps we can do one on treatments, preventative issues, vaccination, uh, nutrition and disease, water quality management, um, genetic selection, how that plays into health issues, biosecurity and risk management, telehealth. And I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit later on about a course that's available to all of you um, if you want to, to learn more about some of these topics. My goal for today is to kind of introduce and, and discuss some concepts. I'm going to provide some branches for a decision tree. Um, and introduce you to online fish health for fish producers course that I developed with uh, my colleague, Dr. Chris Hartlib from um, University of uh, Wisconsin, Stevens Point. And um, also I'm gonna try to provide some recommendations. So um, part of the thinking, you know, with farmers is, is do you want to, or do you have to do fish health? And in, in many ways, um, fish farmers have had to do fish health when it comes to moving fish uh, interstate. And that's more of the fish health certification uh, process. And that's, that's, that's a whole nother talk. Today, we're talking about kind of voluntary fish health decisions you make, really non-regulatory. And, and the kind of decisions you make that are gonna improve your production, increase your profitability, on the farm and improve the quality of product. As veterinarians, we talk about the difference. Today, we're gonna to be talking about production medicine versus regulatory uh, medicine. So why care about fish health? I just listed some of them. You, you'll be able to add some more, but it's the right thing to do to provide proper care for your fish. Beyond that, um, it's, uh, it, it saves money. It makes money and it helps you stay in business. And um, caring about it also can reduce labor. If 
you do it right and increase uh, predictability of um, when you're going to have product available. And uh, it's a pride issue too. You, know, you want to do things right. So who do you want to do the diagnostics for you? And there's a number of different options. One is yourself. Uh, one is having a dedicated trained staff. Uh, you've already heard mention of veterinarians and fish health professionals, um, a diagnostic laboratory. And really in this case, the answer is, is all the above and, and a team approach. And where I see farmers struggling is um, when they don't take the team approach and try to do it themselves, um, it's very difficult. So um, what you should do with the help of experts, here's, here's a few things. One of, one of the things that's really critical and it's same in all other sectors of animal agriculture. You need to know your fish inventory and record keeping. This may seem really obvious, but it really um, it is something that uh, doesn't occur on some farms. So it's really difficult to tell um, and to gauge even when you, you do something to change it, whether you're making improvements. So you need to accurately track your daily mortalities. I'm just giving you an example here. You know, um, some farms have a trigger point where, um, you know, they want to see less than a half percent daily mortality. When it gets over that, then they have a plan for how they're going to act, who they're going to call, what they're going to do. So just to put it in perspective, you know, that's like five fish out of 100 fish per day. Um, I've been a strong proponent. I've talked a lot in previous talks about doing cost benefit analysis, which basically means um, looking and seeing, you know, what is the cost of what you're doing, cost of the diagnostics, cost, and, and what are the benefits from um, the diagnostics? Same thing with your treatments and so forth. And what you should do, of course, is have a plan and um, have it clear for you and everyone working on your farm what to do, who to call, um, when mortality and morbidity increase. So, you know, what is acceptable survival? Fish don't, don't just die. And I know this seems kind of simplistic, but it, it, it is an issue that on some farms, there's um, a certain willingness to, to overlook that. Now, some of these numbers were put together for, by um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Nora Hickey, when, when she worked with me um, a few years back and wanted to basically look at, you know, what are acceptable mortality rates in various animal production industries? And here we're looking at what's the mortality rate between um, hatching or birth and when when they go to slaughter go to market and um you can see with things like beef it's very low you know broilers are around four percent turkeys are about six seven percent dairy five percent swine and this number of salmon was a number from um, a colleague who presented at uh, a meeting and it was a Norwegian number. And they were, they were being uh, open and, and saying that, you know, their mortality rates were, were 24%. Now you're going to find some farms, particularly salmonid farms, like some trout farms that are going to do quite a bit better. And some of them can really, get below that and start approaching other sectors in, in animal agriculture, you know, closer to 10, 15%. But all of you know that when you're dealing with many of the other species beyond that, in many cases, mortality rates are 30, 40, 50, over 50% 50 of the fish. And in many cases, that's assumed to be that's what happens. 
as Bob pointed out, some of those losses can um, be caused by um, other events, uh, you know, starvation, predation, so forth. But we have to look at what component of that is infectious disease and address that because there's no way you can make money uh, successfully when um, you have that kind of uh, accepted mortality, particularly because of the variability that adds into it as well, and unpredictability of your products. When I talk about um, costs and benefits, this is a procedure called a partial budget analysis that we use. And this is an example from a trout farm that um, I was working with that had a issue with spironucleus, which is a parasite that affects um, the intestines of the trout. Their mortalities um, during the period of uh, three to eight months of age um, you know, approached 40%. And we were able to go in there and using um, pretty basic techniques, light microscopy, identify the parasite, and then provide recommendations. In this case, it was Epsom salt top dressed into the feed. So if you look at what I'm laying out here is if you look at the cost, even if the, it costs and a high estimate for let's say you're doing a lot more and it wasn't in this case as high as $3,000. But let's say you're in, in the hundreds of dollars. Nonetheless, when you look at the benefits, what did, what did this contribute to that farm on an annual basis? You know, in terms of survival of the fish, estimates um, talking to the farmer were on $10,000 on an annual basis. They weren't having to buy the same volume of eggs because the fish were, were surviving beyond that uh, time period. Reduced labor because during the mortalities, a staff had to be picking uh, dead fish and removing them and, 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 and on, a, on a constant basis. And um, it led to additional efforts to have to clean the screens and keep things open. And in addition, the unpredictability required that it, at later dates, in order to meet the customer's demand, they had to buy fish from other people. And that's that um, replacement fish cost. So really, when you total the whole thing together, um, we're at 22000 on an annual basis in terms of benefits. And, and when you do your uh, partial budget analysis, you basically su subtract your, the costs um, from those benefits. And you see in this case, uh, $19,000. But you should do that for all. So. Um, if you, if you don't take care of fish health, disease w will make you lose money. And um, there have been um, oh, 30 years that I've worked in aquaculture, uh, many unfortunate cases where um, very large investments have failed due to um, fish health reasons. Um, and short of losses from dead fish, you know, you're, you're losing money by raising unhealthy fish. So the approach, you know, think about putting in basic terms is in order to address fish health is, you know, whether you're going to be focused more on a preventative or just react. And some farms um, have preventative programs and some don't and, and just react. And of course, um, the best approach is to, to incorporate both of those components. You know, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that this this triad of disease has been, uh, you're probably all familiar with it in terms of the host, the environment, and the pathogen. And it's a consideration when you're um, trying to sort out what's going wrong. And you've heard Bob mention it, I'm sure Bill will mention it as well. It's, it's something that um, I'll talk about a little bit too. But what I want to talk about now is is aspect of, of risk management and, and kind of looking at risk identification, uh, risk uh, assessments, risk mitigation, risk communication. Don't want to get too bogged down on this, but part of it, what I want to talk about is uh, we want to be able to identify what are the, what are the risks. And part of this is looking at these matrices 
which kind of pair up the likelihood uh, estimates that you're going to get a particular pathogen. And if you get it, how big of a deal is it going to be? That is, what's the consequences? And you can see on this table, and we'll spend a little time on it. If you look at the consequences on the top, you, you can range from something that's fairly insignificant, you know, some that maybe you call minor, but then major and, and catastrophic categories. And then the other is, what is the likelihood you're going to get it? And so I've put a few um, uh, uh, pathogens on this chart. And just one example, for example, uh, one is uh, for heterosporosis. And heterosporosis, how likely is that that you're going to see it on your yellow perch farm? Well, we haven't seen it in 20 years, so the likelihood is really pretty low. And if you were to get it, um, you know, based on the evidence we have, it, it's it's uh, not really suggestive that it causes significant mortalities. So that's why you see it listed in that box that way. You know, uh, and you can argue where these lie, but, um, you know, and, and I'll add another one in there in terms of going over, the chances of getting VHS are actually remote if you're looking at your fish farms. Why do I say that? Because we've been testing extensively for VHS uh, main, since uh, 2007. We were testing salmonids before that, but now we're testing all kinds of species yet there has not been any uh, detections on it. Of course, that one differs from heterosporosis in that if you get it, it it's, it's a major problem for a number of different reasons. But when you look at a lot of our fish diseases and you compare them to things like avian influenza or bovine tuberculosis, um, which, which are more in the lower right-hand corner, you know, we, we don't have the fish diseases that fall into that same category. Why? Because those other diseases are also uh, human health diseases. And I have one in there, FNO, and that's um, uh, Francella notoensis, which, which I actually, you know, one is if you're raising tilapia, it, the possibility is, is there. Uh, we've detected it in um, farms in, in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, the consequences, even saying moderate is, maybe a little bit low on the scale. So anyways, part of it is what are the um, pathogens that you're gonna be concerned about and how are you gonna approach that? And part of it is what are the, what are the risks? And one way to uh, arrive and identify the risks is to arrive at them, perhaps you do it yourself. The other is, you know, maybe you consult one expert And thirdly, you consult a panel of experts. And this chart, I'm just kind of put together, and this is really kind of data from, from my head. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is if you look at the first set of bars, that's the farm, that's, that's how many pathogens you're probably going to think about. If you, if you have a veterinarian or fish health professional, um, and there's going to be a whole range in how many they're going to they're going to be able to increase the number of things that you really need to think about but it really increases when you include all of those in in the you know the fish health profession and that's where that team of experts really kind of heightens your ability to identify and i, I don't want to confuse identifying with um um viewing it as all of those are going to be responded to at the same level. It's good to know what's out there. And it's also good to know to differentiate what things are really most likely. And if they do, are going to be a big problem and how you're going to deal with it. White spots, not always um, ick. And um, this came to mind because just in the past month, another colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Nicole Niedelsbach, uh, and I were discussing a case like this. So on farms, I, I, 
it occurs to it. It's not, not, if you have white spots, it's not always sick. It's not always even a parasite. It really is quite often a misdiagnosed, um, but it really is quite easily diagnosed if um, a skin scraping is conducted, use light microscopy, you know, in some cases, if it's not um, caused by the parasite, then a uh, histopathology might be. And, and there's other ones, you know, gray patches are not always columnaris. So the first thing is really to know, and, and sometimes run into situations where farmers really feel they know what they're looking at. And I'll be honest, I have a lot of experience, but I avoid being um, assuming that it is always necessarily what it is solely based on what it, uh, the growth signs are. Red sores are not always aromonas or frunculosis. And yeah, tilapia um, aren't bulletproof. They do um, get actually many diseases. So if you want to learn more about fish health, I want to introduce you to this course. It's the um, Fish Health for Producers course. It'll take you about five or six hours. It's You can do it at your own rate. It's um, available on um, this site here, and I provided the link um, to the organizers, and they can share this is at the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility. And um, this course is really to educate you and to kind of inform you and kind of alleviate you know, some of the concerns, um, make you feel a bit more comfortable. It's web-based, it's self-paced, easily accessible, it's free. Um, it's, um, and it discusses a number of different things and it, it kind of really enhances this concept of working together with a team. These are the modules that are on it. The first module, um, is just general introduction to aquaculture. And then there's one on risk management, biosecurity, water quality, because that is, um, really, um, what you start with when you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, how to prepare for a fish health inspection. That's more of the regulatory aspects. Um, and then um, how to understand uh, fish health assessment. And um, fish health assessments have been around for a while. I modified a technique and have been using it for a number of years and taught uh, veterinarians and others uh, um, how to use it. And uh, currently working with the fish health section to reintroduce it to um, fish health people and producers. And the, the sixth module is really fun. It's on um, different cases. So again, these modules kind of cover different aspects, like the first one on, on our culture it gives you a feel um, for, for those who are just starting out uh, to get a sense. And, and these are actual slides and and tables from it to give you a sense of um, what it talks about. Again, the second module kind of focuses in on losses and risks and and getting further into, you know, what is an infection? What is disease? What's contagious? What, is it, what do these things mean? Um, and, and where does disease uh, come from? Um, and some best management practices, for example, these sorts of things, which we, uh, you know, we could talk about um, in depth on a, another, another seminar. Water quality, again, because when you're going to do any diagnosis, you, you have to have a basis there because um, many of the, um, even the infectious diseases originate from water quality problems. And so, um, it tips the balance when you think back on the triad, you know, if the environment is compromised, the water quality is, um, it really provides an advantage to the, um, the pathogen to, um, to get it more of a hold. And it also weakens the, the strength, the immunity of the, of the fish. So, um, these are some of the things we talk about in detail. So, um, you can, you can go to that and again, it's, um, available. The fourth module really gets into the nitty gritty of fish health inspections, why they're done, sampling procedures, you know, what's happening at the lab, uh, wh why are 
so many samples sent in, why does it take time, and how are they tested for, and then how a, a fish health certificate is completed and um, what, that, what that means. Um, and also, you know, what's involved and why it takes time, the, the sampling techniques, for example, for collecting tissue samples, and the importance of it being done in a very careful, careful way. And of course, this is really oriented, um, we do, I've developed a whole training for, for veterinarians, and this, that training is available through the American Association of Fish Veterinarians on, on the web, their website. And, um, but it's important as producers to understand, you know, what's, what's going on behind all this to put it in perspective. The fifth module, again, with the um, assessments is focusing in and it goes step by step and it goes through the different um, organs and, and we look at, you know, gills and we talk about what it means when you're seeing different um, things grossly, as we call them, um, on, on the gills. And then what that suggests the next step should be in terms of diagnostics. The final module is related to uh, these cases. And there we have um, some great cases um, ranging from, you know, catfish, trout, yellow perch, and so on, um, uh, all these different cases. So um, I wanted to share that. And here's one example of one, which is trout-oriented one on bacterial gill disease. And, and hope to get when you take this, and I should say the course has been out for more than 10 years. There's close to a thousand um, people who have taken this course in not only the United States, but um, in a number of countries, in, including um, different continents um, uh, you know, from Europe, Africa, Australia, and Asia. So I'm getting near the end of my talk. And uh, what I just want to kind of reorient you on is prepare for disease losses because they're going to come. Put together your team. Know who you're going to call. You got to keep excellent records. And know when you need help. Um, better to call more often than not enough. Know when to respond, uh, when not to let things kind of uh, go on, and know who to call, and also track the costs of all this so you can you can see. But definitely don't do nothing and, and don't fly solo. And um, I just want to also kind of give you more information that the American Association of Fish Veterinarians on their newly developed uh, website have a site for Find a Fish Vet. And these are veterinarians throughout the country. And um, these, uh, our association is making an effort to try to connect um, you as producers with the veterinarians and these veterinarians with the labs like, um, like Bill's lab. And he's gonna talk about that next. So with that, um, that's the end of my talk in the interest of time. And, um, I look forward to questions because that that's the fun part. Thanks, Myron. One um, clarification, going back to the slide of the partial budget analysis, we couldn't fully see the bottom line. So can you tell us those numbers at the bottom, the total cost? So the total cost, you know, the total cost I put in there um, would have been um, closer to, to $800 actually in that case. And the total benefits, as I recall, was something like around 20,000. And that's, that's why, you know, you subtract the, whatever you, you pay, whether it's the, the veterinary costs, the laboratory costs, the, uh, the cost for your treatment, the cost for the Epsom salt. Um, you add that all together and then, and then you, you compare in the other column, um, what did you gain from, from that? How much money you're saving now that you're not losing fish, now that you have a pr uh, predictable uh, product. And so in that case, you know, it, it, 
Um, and it varies depending on the cases, you know, and sometimes the cost and benefit is close together. But one thing that really gets overlooked is that um, farmers have generally just focused in on the cost. Oh, this is going to cost me a lot or this, you know, the cost of it. But um, when you look at the benefits and when we've done this, it's remarkable how huh, if you if, if you do the whole tally, uh, how beneficial it is. So but that's up to you as a producer. If you take that extra step, you'll see the difference. And, you know, the most profitable producers, they know this and they're doing it. And, um, you know, if you're a farmer, you want to be in that category, too. Great. Thank you. We'll be back for questions in just a bit. We're going to hand it off now to Bill. Great. Always good to follow Myron. Uh, let me get my uh, presentation up here. Whoop. There we go. Well, thank you very much for um, um, giving me this opportunity to talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, myself or, or Kennebec River Biosciences, we are a diagnostic lab. We've been around 25 years. April was actually our 25th anniversary. We uh, work exclusively with aquatic animals, uh, finfish, shellfish, shrimp. Um, we provide a range of diagnostic, regulatory, and veterinary services, as well as uh, autogenous vaccines. We have a USDA uh, licensed vaccine facility, um, as well as uh, uh, producing probiotics. So we kind of do uh, soup to nuts, anything aquatic. Um, we do a lot of logistics, moving fish and eggs, either interstate or internationally. Um, our veterinarian on staff, Dr. Peter Merrill, was with uh, USDA APHIS for 10 years as the director of live animal imports. So um, we have a, a number of individuals who have, uh, uh, you know, experience in, in a variety of, uh, I guess, all things uh, aquaculture and aquatic species. So I, I wanted to focus a bit on uh, for, for the purposes of this talk on our, on our services. And I, I know uh, the, the talk was to be focused on diagnostics, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about the, the regulatory inspections as well, because that, that is the bulk of what, or it is a large part of what we do um, as a lab, um, especially in the finfish realm. And so I kind of wanted to talk about our perspective as a lab and how what are the things that are important to us and, and how that process works, both on the regulatory inspection side, but also on the diagnostic side, which I'll uh, get into um, um, a little bit, well, a lot um, after the regulatory uh, inspection. Um, many of you, if you're doing any sort of interstate movement with, with fish, or uh, probably a, a smaller number doing international movements um, have to have some sort of regulatory testing done. And this depends, you know, the, the type and, and scope of your testing is typically driven by the export market, whether that's a state or, or a country. Um, and each of those have sort of different uh, sort of processes that, that go along with them. Um, it is controlled. It, it's a very, many of you who have, who have sort of touched on, on this, these inspections know it's, it can be quite complex. We have 50 states, we have 50 sets of regulations. Um, you know, country wise, uh, every country has its own set of regulations. So it can be quite challenging sometimes if folks don't know what is required both on the collection side, as well as the testing side in the lab. And so from, from the inspection side, um, there's quite a number of 
really important things that we have to identify when, when we're doing these types of inspections. Um, probably the biggest right off the bat is, is the type of collector that we would need. Um, this can be a veterinarian. It can be an aquatic animal health inspector through uh, those folks are certified through the American Fishery Society. It could be some state agency person, either a DNR or maybe an ag uh, person or veterinarian. Could be some federal official, a federal vet, or it could be some other person, uh, you know, professional if they've been sort of uh, recognized by the state or the importing state that they can do those types of inspections. Um, it, everyone is slightly different. If you're doing export, uh, if you're doing these this testing for export markets, then it has to be done by a USDA APHIS accredited vet. Um, if it's interstate, then you have a lot more flexibility um, as to who can do those. Um, the type of inspection is important. Is this gonna be lot-based inspection or facility-based? Um, you know, many folks are, are, are sort of um, used to the lot-based testing where we do 60 fish per lot. And that's based on statistical numbers of uh, pathogen prevalence in the facility. But increasingly, we're moving more towards a risk-based sort of sampling program for these inspections where we will test uh, a number over the facility. Right now, because of the language in the OIE, we typically do 150 to 175. But I envision that, that there might be more flexibility over time as uh, the new uh, new initiatives within USDA, notably CAPS, uh, comes into play um, because that should allow us to reduce some of the numbers and, and thereby the cost uh, on some of these inspections. Um, the assay types, we, we on the lab side have to determine what assays we can use. Um, a lot of times this is dictated to us. Um, certainly um, any labs that are doing export testing um, have to get our assays approved or our SOPs for those assays approved through the National Veterinary Services Lab through USDA. And so we have to submit our SOPs and then they give us approval to run those assays. And so we have to use those if it's for export testing. Um, so we don't really have any wiggle room. Um, with with uh, some of the domestic movements, that follow the AFS Blue Book, there really isn't a lot of wiggle room there <laughs> either. Um, some states do allow, you know, you can get away a little bit from, from some of the, the Blue Book uh, assays in there, but for the most part, you have to follow those as well. But there are, you can, there is some flexibility with whether you choose, say, a, a more rapid assay, like a fluorescent antibody test in the case of Renibacterium salmoninarum, or you could do culture. So with certain pathogens, there is a little bit of flexibility as to what assay type you can use. Um, most farmers want it done as quick as possible, um, but uh, you know where we're screening for viruses, uh, typically that takes 21 to 28 days to screen. So we're kind of on that schedule uh, anyways. Um, as I mentioned, every state is different um, and, and country to country, um, you can get differences. And so the required pathogen list that you have to test for um, can be either short or it can be quite long. Typically, the more states and countries you, you ship to, the bigger the list is, is going to be. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really challenging. And I think one of the things that I know our lab sort of prides itself on is, is really trying to work with the farmer to kind of help any way we can to meet that. And one of the things we really try to do is is assist the farmer and the, the, uh, the veterinarian or other collector to really um, understand what the regulations are for a particular um, you know, exporting destination so that we don't miss something. So for instance, if, if somebody's shipping to Canada, well, there's a federal requirement that we have to meet for CFIA, but then all the provinces, like all the states have, have their own testing that, that that typically goes above and beyond what CFIA would like. So you really have to manage um, all of those requirements and, and it can be quite daunting uh, sometimes to, to really understand, particularly as, as regulations change, which, uh, which they, they can, 
Um, and, and particularly in the US, that goes, um, I think without saying for, for new species that are being cultured. When you, you know, we're seeing species like European sea bass, eels, yellowtail amberjack. And when they put these typically land-based facilities in, in a state, well, the regulators aren't really, I don't think they, certainly they don't have a history with that species. And so it becomes, um, uh, you know, a discussion with the regulators to determine what things do we have to test for and, and how do we test for it. Um, certainly, um, Another big aspect of this is the number of lots. Number of lots typically, you know, you know, translates into cost of these inspections. So um, how you define the lot, which depends uh, a lot on the inspector and who's doing the collection. So um, that that obviously can be, um, you know, challenging sometime. Obviously, the farmer wants fewer lots, and other folks might, you know, the collector might disagree with that. Um, the type of laboratory you use. Um, so some labs uh, just are within a state and they just do intrastate inspections. And so where they might get recognized by the state authority, whereas a, a lab that might do more uh, inspections for interstate might, might have to meet, you know, certainly they got to meet the, the acceptance by uh, those state regulators where the fish are coming into. Um, and then on top of that, if you're doing export testing, you do have to go through this process of, of getting your, the assays you're going to use um, approved by NVSL through, through USDA APHIS. So they maintain a list that's on the internet of the labs that are able to do export uh, testing. And this is for fin fish, shellfish, uh, bivalve shellfish, and uh, shrimp. So, I mean, at the end of the day, for these inspections, th there is a cost, but they do provide uh, farmers access to different markets. I think one of the challenges um, right now um, is that many of the states, you know, are overseen by natural resource agencies. And so their level of risk is, I think they want it to be as close to zero as possible. So that, you know, that, that can be challenging. And so... Um, that's why I think a lot of this is driven by the, the, why the inspections are set up the way they are. Um, we hope that'll change over time as sort of this is more seen, these aquaculture is seen more like traditional farming and it falls under sort of the agricultural model. Um, at the end of the day, farmers need to be able to ship to their export markets. Uh, as Myron said, I, I think what's key to this, it's got to be a collaboration between the collector, uh, typically a veterinarian, the lab, and the competent authority at the end of the day. So we all know what's expected. Um, the collections are done appropriately, and that the farmer in the end can send uh, animals or, or gametes to uh, that market uh, without any without a hitch. I, I think What's been challenging is you're seeing an increasing complex regulatory environment um, overall. Um, I don't know that that's going to change, but I think some of the initiatives, as I mentioned, put forward by USDA, uh, this comprehensive uh, aquaculture health program standards, I think will help um, to, um, you know, farmers to um, manage costs and to lower risk and thereby lower to lower testing. Um, and so I think we're all hopeful um, that, that this will occur. So getting to the diagnostic part of, uh, of the talk, um, th this, this is challenging. I think the, the two previous speakers, you know, hit it on the head, you know, understanding when you have a problem, that's the biggest, you know, I think that's what sort of, kicks this whole thing off of do, do I have a problem or don't I have a problem? I mean, I, you know, I, I typically rely, and I, I've been in this industry for 25 plus years, there are still farmers that know fish and know their fish, many of them know their fish better than, than I ever could. And so they understand when, you know, behavior deviates from normal. And I think, 
I think it's a discussion between the farmer, if they feel there's a problem, the veterinarian, um, if there's a veterinarian involved, and, and kind of get a getting a complete picture uh, of what's going on. Yes, you typically have a in, in many cases an increase in mortality, but what else is going ar on around that? Temperature, do, other things, where you got the fish, um, your water source. All of that becomes important as you try to understand, particularly from the lab part, um, how we might structure the testing. Because I think one of, the, one of the things that we try to do is we're very cognizant of cost. Um, I mean, yes, we make more money um, when we, we run all sorts of tests, but that's not what we wanna do. We wanna determine the best course of action of testing and, and really look at it from a cost benefit um, you know, standpoint so that we're not, you know, throwing the kitchen sink at, at every diagnostic case and spending a whole lot of money uh, for the farmer. I think the other really important part is the level of urgency. Um, and, and that really is, is driven by the farmer. Um, do they feel it's bacterial? Um, are we going to have to get a VFD? Are we going to have to treat some other way? And I think that's really important there. Typically it's urgent or very urgent or critical. Um, however you want to describe that. And so we do, you know, I think do try to turn, um, you know, results around or more importantly, rule out things if we can uh, rather quickly. Um, I, think, I think for us from the lab part, getting back to that determining the type of testing, we really look at the farm history, particularly what species, because that can, you know, if you've got largemouth bass, and you're losing, you know, animals, and the water's warm, you know, I would think, you know, could be a wartsail epistocida, could be largemouth bass fire. So there are certain things we might key on. It's not to rule, it's not to sort of exclude everything else, but there are certain things we really want to focus on and rule out rather quickly, knowing uh, particularly the species, um, what might be the real pathogens of concern, given you know, the data that we can collect for, from the farmer. So that's, that's really important to have a, a full understanding of what's happening on, on the farm. So, you know, when, as a preface to this, so one of the things, um, you know, as a lab, we can, we can kind of approach this from two ways when, when the farmer does want to submit samples. So, we can either, there are cases where we will work directly with the farmer and they submit whole fish, but the better option is if a veterinarian particularly is involved um, and they're there kind of um, working with the farmer to work with the lab, because I think that that adds a level of they're on the ground, they see what's going on and can sort of ground truth some of what the farmer is saying. Um, you know, from our lab, we try to fit in as best, however, the farmer and and veterinarian want us to, to work with them. So we can send supplies out um, so that they do the sampling. They could certainly send in fish. And so we really try to make that process as seamless, seamless as possible. So based on my, you know, sort of the, the last slide, we try to define what pathogens we're going to screen for. Is it gonna be a number of viruses? Is it gonna be bacterial? Is it gonna be parasites? how much of that do we want to do? Because obviously as you increase the testing, the cost will go up. And so we do, as I mentioned, we do try to, uh, you know, look out for, for the farmer, but understanding that they want an answer right away. Because if you, if you limit the testing and you don't get an answer, that's a problem as well. So, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act sometimes. Um, with diagnostic testing, we have a lot more flexibility on the assays we can use. We're not sort of limited to what, um, you, know, it, it, you know, on the regulatory inspection side, what we have to use. And so we have all sorts of PCR assays, which allow us to, you know, particularly with viruses, get around viral culture, which can take longer. So in the case of largemouth bass, say, we can, we can take tissue and run it right away for largemouth bass virus and either rule that in or rule that out. So that's really nice. Um, if we do want to go with culture, because there are 
cases where you know we, we want to culture it and particularly you know where we're a vaccine manufacturer as well culturing bacteria is really important if we're going to look at presenting a solution for the farmer and we always like to have the bug we like freezing them down having them archived um, and particularly where we may want to look at a vaccine solution down the road or you know right away it, it depends but you know, culture, we have multiple cell lines derived from fish that we can use to culture viruses. Um, this, the one, the one downside is it can take, in, in some cases, longer. In, in a number of cases, like large mouth bass virus, IPN, you can get virus growing in a couple of days. But some of the times with some of the viruses, like, uh, uh, like uh, infectious salmon anemia virus, we've had it take upwards of two to three, three to four weeks. So, um, and, and with culture on the bacterial side, we have a number of media that we can use. Obviously, um, you know, there are um, standard media like blood auger, blood auger with salt, triptych soy, but then some of, you know, we may need some specialized media um, like uh, chocolate auger or um, TYES for flavos. And so, but we have a, a number of media that we can use to grow all sorts of, uh, of bacterial and screen for those, which uh, again is really important from our perspective. There are a few assays that we can use. Um, one notable one is a fluorescent antibody where we actually have a tagged antibody with fluorescence for Renobacterium salmoninarum. And so we can make a, a tissue squash in uh, the kidney typically, and then we can, we can use that antibody to see if the bacteria is there rather quickly. Um, one of the things we also like to do, because there's, there's always a chance, and we've had any number of cases where you get through the testing and you don't have a virus, you don't have a bacteria, you don't have a parasite, but you're still kind of losing, you know, the farmer's still losing animals. And so what we like to do typically is take histology, where you're taking the tissue and fixing it in 10% buffered formalin or a similar fixative, um, and then having that sectioned and looking for um, pathology or pathogens. Because sometimes it may be environmental, it may be feed related, it could be another pathogen where you might not pick it up with the, the things um, you're using. And so it's always nice to have histology as, I don't wanna say a backup, but to, but to point you in the right direction if you don't get anything, if, if they say, you know, let's say you, you run, you, you know, you, you screen for bacteria on a couple different media type and you don't get anything, but they say, you, you know, the histology comes back and you say, well, you got, you got a, you know, septicemic fish with a, you know, a bacterial infection and they can tell you whether it's gram positive or negative or, or maybe a myco. Um, then at least it points you in the right direction. You could then go back and try to culture that um, so it, it is nice to, to kind of have that. Um, the real important thing about all of this, especially in a, a critical time sensitive, which a lot of these diagnostic cases are, is the turnaround time. So you're really trying to balance getting information back to the farmer and the veterinarian to try to then come up with some type of solution. So you know, let, let, let's say we, we, we sample a fish, we get bacterial growth, you know, we, we get it pure. We would then right away put that uh, either on a Kirby Bauer or an MIC to get an antibiotic susceptibility curve um, so that we at least know, you know, we at least want to get that process started uh, on what antibiotic we might want to use. So, there are ways that we try to accelerate, um, you know, the process, you know, in that case, you know, trying to get an antibiotic, which we know, you know, like fluorophenicol, you got to use a VFD, it can take some time. So we obviously want to do that as quick as possible. And so, you know, we, where we can, and we have a definitive sort of diagnosis, we may not know what the bacterial species it uh, is, that may take a few more days, but at least we can begin the process and understand, okay, this, this, we want to go with this antibiotic and let's, let's get that started. And, um, 
you know, th there are ways to kind of cut with, with some of the 16S sequencing, you can, you can cut some of the ID uh, time down as well. So, you know, the technology is certainly affording us uh, the opportunity to shrink those timelines as well. So the, the critical points I just wanted to point out when you're, you know, you decide you're going to, you know, submit fish, you know, to, to a lab is, you know, do you want to do the necropsy on site or do you want to submit the fish? Um, you know, I think the taking of the samples and the picking of the fish are really critical to getting a good diagnosis and understanding, you know, what's going on. We want, you know, we typically ask for moribund fish. You know, they're, they're kind of, they got all the clinical signs of what you're seeing in the, the larger, you, you know, population of fish that are dying, but they're still alive. And so we euthanize them. We either, we either necropsy them on site or we get those, you know, in a refrigerated, you know, um, situation and, and in a box that's uh, cooled and you get it overnight to the lab where we can do the necropsy. And you generally want to keep these two to five degrees C. Um, you don't, you don't want to freeze them typically. If that's the only way you could do that, then you, you have to do that. Um, it, it can, freezing can knock down, uh, particularly viral, uh, you know, the, the viral uh, load in, in the fish. If you freeze thaw, with every freeze thaw, you lose some infectivity, a, a virus. Uh, same thing with bacteria, but less so. Um, so we don't want to do that. If we're taking histo, we might try to have them take uh, histology samples on site if that's if we can manage that um, because it's really the best sample uh, on site while the fish are still uh, you know alive and you euthanize them and take those samples right away. So these are kind of the big things for, for us and and really trying to um, get an optimal sample in, into the lab. And so that that can be be challenging. You know there are. Good, good samplers, bad samplers. And so it's, a, I think, a constant, uh, uh, you know, education uh, of trying to make sure, especially if the necropsy is done on site, that we, we get suitable samples. And as Myron said, communication and trust is key. If, if a farm doesn't really trust you and they withhold information, that's not going to do anybody any good. And I think that really comes down to you know, over some time showing that uh, you can maintain confidentiality with their information. You're not going to divulge, uh, you know, information that the farmer doesn't want you to. But I think it's important because you need to know, you need to know all the relevant information around, particularly around a diagnostic case. Where'd you get the fish? You know, where's your water coming? You know, stuff that, you know, you know, let's say they brought in a, you know, they brought in fish they weren't supposed to, for argument's sake, you would want to know that, you know, you, you, you know, you would want to know that even though they might not want you to know that in order to get to, you know, get to helping them, you need to know that type of information. Um, the relationship with the vet typically in the diagnostic lab is really important, you know, just being able to work communication, having a good working uh, relationship, I, I think it's it, it's really important. Um, you know, as I've said, we as a diagnostic lab really try to work with uh, you know, particularly a veterinarian on any level they want us to. Some vets want more oversight and want to do the inspections or or the work on site. We facilitate that. Other ones are just as happy to send us uh, uh, the fish and 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 you know send send them to us whole. Um, I think the other thing too, and, and this is a big thing, I've seen this a, a number of times, th there will be cases where farmers, they know they have a problem. It's recognizing when there's a problem is present when they don't think a problem is present. And I think the biggest one I see is, is you know, the, the, the example that sort of typifies this is, is brook trout with IPN. You'll go in and they'll have a brook, they'll have brook trout on site. And they'll say, well, you know, I typically lose, you know, 20, 30% of my fish every year. It's just the way it is. It's, it's, it's the species, it does it. And then you go and do, you know, sampling of those for, for cell culture and they all got IPN. And so 
I, I've, I, there are a number of cases like that in a variety of species where farmers think this is the norm when in fact it's not. And they're losing stuff to pathogen that they're not really recognizing uh, for, for what it is. And I think oftentimes they chalk it up to production or the species or some other thing, but really it's, it's due to a pathogen. And I think, I think that's important over a variety of species to really understand, um, you know, that this can happen. And I think points to the need for some level of routine health testing, just to understand what you have on the farm and what presents a risk to the farm. And can you improve it? Because it, you know, as Byron said, it, 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 it works in our case as well. It will save you money in cases where, you know, if you get IPN off of there, well, you, 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 can, you can save money. And, and, we've, and we've seen that because what, you know, in, in a number of cases, you know, we, we find IPN in the brook trout, they can't sell their fish to certain markets. And so, you know, that's, that's a problem. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, um, a little bit of testing goes a long way. You should understand what is on your farm and what's not on your farm. And I think particularly as we, we go along for a number of reasons, having that health history uh, is really important. Um, and I know on any number of farms, it, it, it does come in handy in, in a number of ways. And so I encourage everybody to come visit Maine, usually in the summer. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill, and to all of our panelists, and to everyone who's been putting great information in the chat today as well. Um, we do have some specific questions, and then I'll move on to some more generalized questions. Um, a couple of questions on disease and solutions to disease. First, what is the best way to combat Calmneris disease? We are interested in learning how to treat it, but also possibly ways to stop it before it comes, comes a problem. Is that for anybody or? Uh, yeah, I'll throw that out to anybody who feels best to answer. I'll, that. Uh, I'll, can, I'll, yeah, go ahead, Myron. You're the I'll, best. I'll just get it rolling and then, Bill, you can jump on, Bob. But uh, the first thing is, as I mentioned in my talk, to make sure it's calm Naris. Um, and and I, so, um, you know, if we have a diagnosis, calm Naris, of course, is, is one of the diseases where that whole triad really comes in where um, we have environmental conditions that really favor it. And it varies depending on the species. So I'll, I'll let the other panelists uh, add some comments if they like. Yeah, I think that's important on the treatment side. I, our veterinarian usually handles that. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Myron, but you can treat with, I, I think is it, um, oh, now, it, now it escapes me. Alamide, is that one of the treatments they, some people use or salt? Um, it, it's tough because it's an external, external bacteria. So obviously treating with antibiotics is not, uh, it's, it's mixed. Although you can get severe infections where it does go septicemic in the kidney and we do get it out of uh, fish all the time. I will say from, from the vaccine side, we've had mixed, mixed results as many folks have. Sometimes they work. We've seen it work in couple cases in musky and pike, but generally they don't, it doesn't work all that well. I think there's so many different, and we use the strictly autogenous, you know, we take the bug out of the affected population and create that vaccine. But I think there's so many different sort of strains and that it gets, it gets challenging on that level as well. So Dr. Tom Locke, he's been working with a related organism, you know, Columnaris being related to in the group of flavobacteria. And there's a flavobacteria that causes cold water disease. And one of the things that um, he and other colleagues around the country have found is Bill has pointed out that there's a number of different strains. And that those strains vary in terms of how responsive they are to treatments or vaccine and how they vary in terms of different conditions. So again, it really kind of circles back to the value of sending samples to a um, a lab such as Bill's to start. Right. 
Um, what fish diseases are there a vaccine for? And when should fingerling su suppliers vaccinate their fish so they are ready for when customers are receiving them? So, I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the list keeps growing. You've got, you know, the, the you know, Aramona salmonicida, Yersinia ruckeri, Lactococcus garbii, all the streps, um, Vibrio harvii, you know, photobacterium. It, the, basically, uh, you know, if there's a, a bacteria and we find it in a population and we think it's causing disease, you can make a vaccine for that. And so typically what we go through is we don't, in, as a general statement, we don't know how well it would work. The caveat to that is a lot of them have a lot of information in the literature supporting you. So Aramona salmonicida has that vaccine, either an immersion or injectable, has been around for a very long time. So we know, we have an expectation that it will work. Um, same thing with your senior record. A lot of the gram negatives work extremely well, both as an immersion and injectable solution. Some of the streps, um, they work well as injectable, less so as an immersion, but they've come out with new technology with immersion adjuvants. So we've really bumped up the, the, uh, the effectiveness of those vaccines. So really there, there isn't a limit um, unless we run into, you know, the ability to culture it or there's some weird thing why, why we can't create a vaccine, but generally we can make a vaccine out of, of pretty much anything. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, what are the legal implications of having a vaccine made through a lab? So, I mean, there's no, I mean, we, we typically make them through our USDA licensed facility. It's overseen by the Center for Veterinary Biologics. So they approve our adjuvants. They you know, inspect our facilities. So I don't know that there's really from the regulatory standpoint, no issues. If for some reason someone doesn't want a vaccinated fish, I, I don't, you know, if your buyer has a problem with it, that's the only thing I, I wouldn't know about that. But on, on our side, there's really no, no issues with, with using vaccines. Unlike antibiotics, um, we don't have the issue of a withhold in terms of uh, market and so forth. If you look at animal agriculture in general, you know the more we've used um, vaccination, the less we've had to rely on antibiotics. In fact, that's the history of the um, uh, salmon industry. Um, and, and that already began back um, in the 80s into the 90s, the more the vaccination was incorporated, you know, by identifying the pathogens, the antibiotic use went, went way down. And I, I think that's particularly uh, uh, an important statement uh, when we look at land-based, because I think when you, when you put an antibiotic into a land-based facility where you have intense recirculation and, and those biofilters, we, we had one um, that we worked with and we went through all three antibiotics in about six months. And so it, when you apply that an antibiotic, it, it just puts evolutionary pressure on the bacteria. Um, whereas if you were to vaccinate, it's neutral. That has no effect on the biofilter whatsoever because it's just inactivated uh, bacteria going in. And so um, I think that's an important you know, point to be made. I, I saw some... Uh, comments in the in the chat about reportable diseases, and if I could just add to that, very excellent point that um, that there are in each state and um, on a national level diseases that when are detected, they need to be reported, and the reason they need to be reported is so that we can all respond collectively um, as as a country and as a industry to these things, and and there's legal requirements. Um, to do so. So there are some diseases that um, if they're detected, there's an obligation from the diagnostic laboratory, from the veterinarian, and actually from the farmer uh, to report those. Those laws vary from state to state. Um, but um, this is the way that USDA keeps a handle on, 
on, on what's going on and is able to report to other countries. A lot of times other countries base their uh, willingness to take our products on our ability to report to them uh, what we have. Um, and that's where reportable diseases are important. Very good point. Um, we are at time. If our panelists are able to stick around to continue to answer questions, um, we will continue to do so. I'd like to at least end with one more question, but um, please let me know if you need to drop off and we will uh, work around that. Um, you know, talking about timeframes, can you briefly detail, and I, I'd like each one of you to kind of add to this answer. Can you briefly detail how best to deal with that lag time between observing an outbreak, getting a diagnosis from a vet, and receiving a shipment of medication or medicated feed before mortality losses are too high? It's easy, so, right? Yeah, no, it, it, if you don't mind, maybe I can start it and then it'll give Bob an opportunity and Bill an opportunity. And, and what I would say is that, yeah, it's um, as, as Bill was pointing out, it, it takes time to do some of these tests and to get these results. And it takes time in order for the coordination to get the medication and for the medication to be uh, incorporated in the feed. But, you know, probably starting with Bob, the issue is, you know, as a farmer, where do you, uh, when, when do you, when do you make the call? You know, do you do it today or are you going to wait till the end of the week? Um, and that's, that'll make a big determination on the entire scale because the more you wait on an issue, the more it's going to be a problem. So I'll leave it at that. And then uh, Bob and Bill can add to it. I was going to say, you have to have a, a pretty good sense of paranoia. Um, yeah. Fish do get sick all the time. It's just a question of how bad it's going to get. So the, the first thing to realize is, are, am I stressing my fish? And then from there, it can go pretty fast. And yeah, the diagnostic takes quite a while. So I always say, you know, have a good sense of paranoia, be on top of it. And then as, as soon as you really think you have a problem, I mean, I, I don't remember which one of you two said that sometimes you don't have a problem, but you really have to kind of gauge. For me, the decision is, do I really have a problem? And then I, I'm going to go for the diagnosis. And that's it's kind of a tough call. It depends on a lot of things. How many fish? What's the value? If it's just a few fish in a tank that you don't really care about, okay. But if it's a multiple tank system, one tank looks sick, but the others potentially it could spread to other tanks, then you've got a really high value situation there. And you really do need to get a diagnosis. And, and there's an evolution with the farmers, you know, when you're starting out, new farmers will, will, will maybe take that approach, but when they really get hit and they lose a lot of fish, then the response time starts shortening, you know, in, in subsequent ones and they begin to, to learn, you know, how, how more quickly, but yeah, it's a cost issue too. You, you can't afford to be, you know, sending stuff to the lab all the time. But that's where I don't think as a farmer, you want to rely on yourself. That's where you want to have a veterinarian. You want to have a fish health team. You want to have, you know, a lab like Bill's involved so that they can help you uh, with those decisions on when when to make decisions start, you know, moving. I mean, I think from the lab side, you try to, you know, when a case comes in, you try to, you know, look for, you know, parasites to the extent you can rule that out if it's bacterial you get the bacteria you usually the next day or day and a half you have some bacterial growth you then have an idea if it's a virus there's not really much you can do so it's driven by what is your response going to be to you know each of those findings you know if you find a parasite you can treat with some formaldehyde or something you you you, you know you can do that right away the bacterial stuff you really try if you have growth and it's say it's confluent and pure, you try to then take that and move that along as quick as you can get a um, get an antibiotic acceptability so you can get those results and then move along the ID as quick as you can. Um, you know, if you come up with a virus like largemouth bass virus, there's there's really not a lot the farmer can do. There's no treatment options for for that. So it really then becomes a 
well, I either got to deal with it or I depopulate. And so, um, so a lot of those viruses are, yeah, you want to know what they are, but there's really not much you can, you can do about them in the end. Actually, that is a good follow-up. If you've got a multiple tank system, you need to at least isolate or try to isolate of one tank if it gets sick versus the other ones. There's a, so there's some management things you can do as well sure. as diagnostic. Yeah, um, and I guess it, expanding on that, what, um, you know, to be the best partner in this collaboration, what technology should a farmer have um, to better manage fish health on the farm and improve their system? So they should definitely have water quality testing and good records. Those are the two probably primary ones. And then uh, observations in their notes. Um, I mean, just being on top of trends is really important. But water quality is using 99% of the primary uh, initial problems. Okay. A um, couple of questions about ponds. I've done checks on basic water quality parameters in my ponds and they're good, but it seems like my fish still get diseases. What easy, what, what can I do easily and could it be feed? So are there certain indicators to know whether it's feed or something else? You see feed's uh, not an issue as long as it's, uh, it hasn't expired, as long as it's not too old uh, because all the feed mills are regulated and inspected. So that's usually not a problem. Um, it's hard to say because it's an individual case basis, but you could have some other factor, uh, wild animals, wild birds bringing something in. I mean, that, that's where I would look first and not the feed. And the other thing is, um, could your water quality be changing over daily time frame as the algae photosynthesizes and changes the carbon dioxide levels and the pH levels. Can, can that be impacting your fish, stressing them over a daily uh, cycle? That'd be my recommendation. I, I would just add, I, I guess I'm not, I, I, I guess I, I never had concerns with the feed, and but we've done, uh, we've done some work on looking at feed and I think my level of concern has gone up because things are getting through. We've, we've cultured Wysela species, Lactococcus species out of feed. And in one case, we had a farm get something and we're not really sure how it got there. And feed is, you know, an issue. And certainly we, we had a farm that, uh, it wasn't a pathogen, but it, it was causing outright mortality in, in the fish. Uh, and it's it's really, I, I think the part that's disconcerting is, and I, I don't deal with the feed companies directly, this is secondhand, that I, I think farmers find it difficult to get information out of the feed companies as to what what is going into the feed and what's what ingredients they're using, how it's milled. And I think that to where I have a number of larger farmers where they're doing their own independent analysis of the feed because they're concerned about it. So that, that can't be done for everybody, but I think I think it should just be on everybody's radar uh, with respect to feed. So you indicated that you're uh, losing fish, and I think this is where you, you bring in a veterinarian working with a diagnostic lab like Bill's. And, and in terms of the, the, the necropsy uh, that would be conducted, the, the health assessment, there you would be assessing the organs and determining, in some cases, we can begin to see some signs of nutritional diseases. If that's suspected, then you use a, a lab like Bill's in order to do histopathology, in order to sort out uh, some changes that would occur in the organs associated with um, nutritional diseases. Nutritional diseases, um, depending on the deficiency, um, can affect different organs. So one is to do a sampling of those fish that are affected. It, are, are there significant eye lesions? Eye lesions 
you know, make you think of a number of things, methionine and other things, so forth. You know, it, the liver, is the liver extremely pale? You start, you know, thinking about the fat, protein content to the diet, so forth. Um, these these things can, can all be, they can be sorted out and determined. Um, okay, and specific to large mouth bass, is there anything else that you would add to that? Okay. <laughs> I guess the only thing I would add that, um, you know, that's where you bring in someone like, um, you know, Matt Smith from uh, Ohio State, where you're looking at the whole, your whole pond. How deep is it? What's total volume? What, what, is, what are the fluctuations in temperature? Um, do, what's your aeration? Um, you know, what's the level of oxygen that's being maintained, the pH, um, and so forth. So, and, and then, yeah, and then your food base there. Um, okay. I was going to say also, largemouth bass do have a particular thing where they can't uh, digest carbohydrates very well. So your feed could be the wrong kind mm -hmm. of feed. Yeah. If you're feeding them like a standard trout diet, that's not acceptable. They need more like a salmon diet. So that is, I just assume people are using the correct diets. That's not always the case either. Good point. Okay, just a couple more. Um, do you see veterinarians mainly utilized by producers if they need them for international shipment or health certificates? And do labs throughout the U.S. require samples to be submitted with a veterinary client-patient relationship? Um, so for export, certainly, um, as far as outside of that for health inspections, uh, there are a few, one of the, one of the big ones is somebody in Wisconsin, um, a veterinarian there who does a, a large number of the health inspections for, uh, in-state and interstate movement, but by and large, it's, it's really a mix of all kinds of folks. I would say, I would say in many cases, it's tough to get a veterinarian out. To the lab. I mean, we do have them and it's growing, but we have a lot of DNR folks doing the collections. We have a lot of state ag folks doing the collection, um, university uh, folks. So it really, just because I, I think it's difficult sometimes to, to get a vet um, to do that, they're just, yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes to, to get a vet. It, it varies on the state, you know, as a number of you know, for the past 22 years, they've kind of developed the program that has trained the veterinarians in Wisconsin. That's why we're, we're in better shape than most states. So it really depends on the will of your state and how much effort put into it in terms of training the veterinarians. And it varies quite a bit, as Bill says. Thank you. Um, where can I find more resources for on-farm diagnostics, methods and diagnostics? I already have the fish disease diagnosis and treatment book by NOGA. What else would you recommend? There's the, the bacterial one. I mean, if they want to get into the nitty gritty, there's the bacterial one. I think Brian Austin, I, I think he did the bacterial one. The viral one is, uh, I think, Ken Wolf. Did, did one on viral. Um, yeah, it's there's a number of ones we use here and I just, they're not at that. I could probably get them um, at some point. The, can, the, blue, can... the blue book, the blue book is online. The AF, AFS fish health section blue book. Some of the chapters are old, but um, still, you know, good information. Um, so that's online. The OIE is online. Great, and we can add those to our resource list. Um, what is the best full spectrum medication for epidermal fish diseases? Uh, excellent water quality. I, I'm, I'm being a little bit funny, but not really, because if you're looking at external lesions, you know, in, in many cases, many of them are originating from um, water quality problems. So there, you know, there, there, we, there we could start. And certainly it's well known, you know, salt can be beneficial for a number of minor conditions. It can be used at different levels, either um, 
kind of um, infinite um, long-term bath or um, or high, higher um, concentration bath, but I wouldn't get a whole lot more aggressive until you really know you, what you're what you're dealing with, because that's that that's um, more likely to contribute to using the wrong drug, killing fish, um, and and running into issues with uh, residues in your fish, um, and so forth. Okay, and one final question to wrap things up, and this is a water quality question of a different kind. Could the herbicides that farmers spray near my ponds hurt my fish? Has there been any significant research on the effect of herbicides that are sprayed aerially, aerially on acreage right next to fish pond? I, I, I get this question very often and I've been involved in these kinds of investigations for, for 30 years. What's interesting is that um, a couple of different things. One, it's, it's kind of tough to go to a, a laboratory and Bill will um, uh, be able to fill this in more and say, can you check for, for, for pesticides? Because the panel is so long and so exp uh, extensive and expensive, it's not possible. If you know the particular um, um, herbicide, pesticide that was used, it, then you can focus it in. And there are select laboratories that can do that level of testing on tissue from dead fish. In my experience, I'll just finish by saying, even though that comes to mind as the first uh, suspect in um, nine cases out of 10, it's something else. But it is a natural thing that pond owners think about. All right. Well, thank you so, so much to all of our panelists. Thank you for staying over a bit to answer all of those questions. Um, so it seems like our takeaways are know what's normal. Um, record keeping and observation is really key to that. Um, don't assume <laughs> diagnosis and really start those collaborations so that you have your team. So you have your, your lab and your vet and, and yourself. Um, so you're not just relying on, on yourself. Um, we will be compiling all the resources and we'll include a link to that. Um, it'll be archived on the Ohio Sea Grant page when we send out um, the recording for this. And finally, uh, for folks who are attending, we will be sending out an evaluation. If you can pro provide us any feedback, that'll help us improve uh, future webinars and, and choose topics there too. So again, thank you all so much and uh, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks.